Right, to find the flaw, it wouldn't hurt to go with the acid flow, but also you can feel free to find the free. So jiggle around, see where the free is. Now, there were some common causes that we talked about at the beginning of this section that can cause a use after free, things like passing an acid pointer to free, premature free caused by erase conditions due to reference counting and automatically garbage collected programming usage, and premature or double freeze caused by logic bugs. Well, out of those, clearly, given all of the hints and words of power we were citing and the little racehorse that was in the name of this particular CVE, we might reasonably expect that it's this kind of thing. So let's understand the root cause. Let's say that there's a single CPU and the Linux kernel is executing this particular ioctal code. Well, if the TTY that was passed in was slave and then the real TTY is also a slave, then what we have in this code is we have the locking of the slave TTY and then the decrementing of the PID count on the slave real TTY. So that has no problem because basically it's locking the thing which is ultimately having its reference count decremented. But if the attacker passes in a master TTY and then the real TTY is slave, then that means that they're locking the master but decrementing the slave. So that is a yes problemo sort of situation because that is locking the master but decrementing the slave and that is a mutual exclusion violation. And if there's one thing the Klingons care about, it's mutual exclusion. So this is going to be a problem when you get into the parallel situation. If you have multiple CPUs executing in parallel, then let's say you've got master slave like this and you've got master slave like that it becomes incumbent upon you, the vulnerability researcher, to consider what sort of interleaving could occur in these sort of race conditions where potentially this CPU could be preempted by some particular code running on that CPU, and then this CPU over here could run, you know, in parallel. And so you basically need to look at the critical section code, right? The critical section for mutual exclusion is the place between when something is locked and when it's unlocked. And you gotta say, okay, well, what sort of organization could I do? Could I put it like this? Could I put it like that? Well, if you're always calling it with master and slave on both CPUs, then there's no real way to win. But if you recognize that if you passed the slave and the slave on one of them and the master and slave on the other, then you have the opportunity that this interleaving could potentially happen. First, it goes down this path and it locks the master, but then it decrements the slave and the lock for the slave is not currently held by anyone. Then this code, like so then a preemption or a parallelization is such that this code over here runs and now this locks the slave and it decrements the reference count, but that would be a over decrement potentially. This could now be decreasing it down to zero and this would actually be freeing this PID. And so basically after that's freed, then any subsequent use of that PID structure would be a use after free. Okay, so slave... Master is locked, but it's decrementing the slave. And then here it decrements the slave again, potentially freeing it. And the question is, can you see the free? Well, you can't exactly see the free. And that's why I put the emphasis on that retain release logic, because it's not immediate and obvious that this thing is going to cause a free. So again, the retain and the release, those are words of power, because in the context of race conditions and mutual exclusion bugs, release can become a free and that can lead to freeing things prematurely which subsequently leads to use after free so you always got to watch out for that free that's embedded in a release because that can lead to the racy free see put another way it is dangerous on release you got release retain release retain and the release is the dangerous part that's what you need to watch out for Okay, so the actual use after free very much depends on the situation here. So we've got this PID struct, and you wouldn't necessarily know it based on the code that I've given you. I've shown you this kind of stuff in the slides leading up to the thing. So we know that, okay, if there's a pseudo terminal, each of those is going to point at a PID. But what you don't necessarily know is that there can be other data structures elsewhere on the system that also have references to the PID and will subsequently be increasing its count. So in this example, we've got four references to this PID, but after the race condition occurs and there's a erroneous extra decrement, 
This could mean that essentially the second to last object that releases its reference will ultimately cause this premature free inside of the release. So if this goes away and that goes away and that goes away, well now because the count was artificially decremented down erroneously because of the race condition, well then that gets freed and then this is now holding a dangling pointer. So there's some socket structure here that now has a dangling pointer to the PID and if the attacker can go ahead and free in, uh, sorry, fill in that memory with some acid, then that means any subsequent use is exactly going to be the use after free. So that's why I say that the actual use in the use after free sort of depends on the situation, you know, what's holding references. But of course, you know, this is a example with an exploit. So we'll show how an attacker can manipulate how many things are holding and then manipulate how far down the count is forced via the race condition and these sort of erroneous decrements and subsequently what thing will be holding the dangling pointer. So back to the sort of intro examples that we saw, we said, well, you can have this racy freesy where multiple legitimate things could be holding a reference to this, but if the malicious code can cause some sort of erroneous or premature free to occur, then that leads to the freeing or destruction of this data. Now it becomes uninitialized, available for reuse by other allocations. And if the attacker can get some acid data in for that allocation, and one of these things uses its dangling pointer, then it is going to catch on fire. So what was the fix for this? Well, if a mutual exclusion problem causes retain release races, then correct mutual exclusion stops them. So we said the, the core issue here was that it was locking the master and then operating on the slave. Well, if you're gonna be operating on the slave, lock the slave. And so make sure that you're actually locking the data that you're accessing. If you do that, then it's all good.